Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the moderator of the next session, Alena Kutsko. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very delighted to welcome you at the next discussion, which is titled The Post-Pandemic Global Disorder, Roles and Responsibilities of Power Players. My name is Alina Kutsko, and I'm director of the Globsec Policy Institute. But more importantly, with me today is a fantastic lineup of speakers who are coming from very different parts of the globe, and I'm sure have equally different opinions, which probably will stimulate a very enlightening discussion. Uh, joining online, we have uh, Shada Islam, who is founder and director of the New Horizons project, joining us from Brussels. Welcome, Shada. Uh, we have Thank Ambassador you. Neil Amdio, who is director at the Gateway House, joining us from Mumbai. Welcome, Ambassador. And we also have Thank with you. us. Good luck. Uh, we have also uh, with us uh, Damon Wilson, who is uh, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council and joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome, Damon. Pleasure, pleasure to be with you, Aina. And here, right here with me in Bratislava, is Bruno Masayesh, who is Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and Senior Advisor at the Flint Global Lisbon. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining us today and for staying with us in the afternoon. We have no officials on this panel, so I'm pretty sure we'll be pretty brave in our statements, even though I must admit the foreign ministers today in the morning were setting the bar pretty high, so I'm sure we'll have a lot to deliver at this panel as well. Uh, Bruno, you're first on my desired list of speakers, at least by the virtue of you being right here with me in Bratislava. A couple of hours ago, we were following with you the session of the foreign ministers of France, Germany, Slovakia, Romania, and Greece. And uh, the French foreign minister, Jean-Yves Le Drian, he said that COVID-19 was a revealer and accelerator, which I interpret as uh, he still agrees with the statement that he made in the spring that the world after or during COVID-19 will be exactly as before, but much worse. Um, is that also the vision that you see? Do you think the world is changing? And if so, how? No, I tend not to agree with that. Uh, I, I was recently in, a, in another conference where there was the question, accelerator or uh, transformer. And I see it more as a moment of transformation. Uh, and I think where we can see that very clearly is at the level of the political economy. There were some trends before COVID uh, pointing towards a greater role for the state, but what we've seen so far are things that a year ago would have been unthinkable. Uh, that uh, important political leaders in France, in Germany, are now talking openly about uh, uh, strategic competition, about the importance of having strategic reserves of fundamental goods, which for the time being are medical supplies, but they could very easily expand into other areas. One can see the same argument now being applied to the, to the problem of climate change and perhaps food supply. So I think larger and larger segments of our economy, at least they will be open to, to debate whether one should move towards a different kind of approach. Uh, I don't think it's the end of globalization, but let me give you this analogy. Perhaps many of the, of the sectors that I, that I just mentioned will come to resemble the energy sector. The energy sector is compatible, of course, with global markets, particularly when it comes to oil. But you always have to balance considerations of efficiency with considerations of security. So you have strategic reserves of oil. You always have uh, uh, the need to diversify. Uh, there was a discussion we had in the case of the energy sector that I think we're now going to have in other areas. Uh, and finally, uh, I expect, I think we've already seen that in the US, uh, less uh, in Europe and in Asia, but I expect that um, many people who have projects of social and political transformation will make this very simple argument. If we were able, in the case of COVID, to stop our economies, to stop one third of our economies, to reshape them in order to save lives, isn't it possible to do the same in the case of other very valuable social goals? Why shouldn't we do the same in the case of climate change? Which, by the way, every year has a higher number of victims already than, than COVID. Uh, 
uh, shouldn't we be able to do the same in the case of uh, racial justice or social justice as a debate that is happening in the US? So I, I, I still think that this is going to be a moment where politics in the grand style is going to make a return with all the risks and the dangers that that entails. But uh, I think it is a moment of transformation, even if, let us say, 20 or 30 years from now, people won't quite remember what the immediate cause was. But I think we're going to go through uh, a period of, uh, of years or decades where suddenly some possibilities uh, are open simply by the fact that we've all gone through the past few months and we realize that actually collective action is incredibly powerful. And finally, I won't talk about it now, but maybe we'll come back to it. I think COVID reopens completely the question of technology and the role of technology in our societies. There will be many people who conclude from COVID that we need a more cautious approach to technology. Many people think that COVID is a result of the Anthropocene, of hum humanity's expansion into uh, areas that were inhabited, creating more possibilities for zoonic transmission of diseases from animals to human beings. There are other people like myself who think that actually COVID shows us that we need a faster approach to technological development. Uh, we're going to need it for climate change as well. So I've already given a number of examples where I think really big questions, bigger than, than we're used to, are being opened up by COVID. Thank you so much, Bruno. And I want to immediately pick up on what you were saying about COVID being creating this possibility for the grand transformation and the rethinking of the social and political environment where we're living. And I want to go to Damon. Uh, Damon, I know you're joining us from the US, so I'll pick up on that. During this conference, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, we didn't talk too much about the US uh, leadership, or some people would say lack of leadership uh, in the world today. And and partly that is because it seems like there is already two groups of people who hold partially irreconcilable opinions. One group uh, probably is led by Heiko Maas, who was here today, who says that the yes is going to continue to withdraw from the world, regardless of who is going to become the president, the next president of the yes, though of course the rhetoric might become much nicer. But also there is another group of people who are saying that if Biden wins, then the um, relations will go back to some kind of normality, and there is going to be a very fruit fruitful cooperation with which is uh, backed by the powerful U.S. leadership in the world. So, Damon, what kind of future are you preparing for, and how do you see the consequences of the U.S. elections to the, some of the trends that Bruno was talking about? Thank you, Elena. First of all, uh, right off the bat, I'd say neither of those scenarios, neither a one of withdrawal or returning back to the past. That's not really going to be, I think, the viable pathway forward for the United States. Let me just say it is with great regret that I'm not joining you in person. Uh, I wish I could be there, Elena, with you and Bruno. Uh, greetings to Ambassador Kotcher, Robert Milan, the whole team. Uh, as a regular at GlobeSec, we so value the debate that you foster across the Atlantic. Um, but I come to this GlobeSec this year with a sense of a little bit of humility because my country is in the midst of a bit of a bout and some body blows domestically, and it's playing out in a very heated election right now. And so I think. Part of this is that um, it is true that no matter what happens on our election day, the priority here is going to be to, to fix ourselves at home so that we have the capacity and the will to play our role on the international stage. So that does mean that we need to focus on how to make our democracy work and governance more effective, on how we overcome the economic catastrophe of COVID, the health crisis, and deal with the terror at our social fabrics with the anti-racist protests we have here. But the good thing is that this is a natural process of repair, self-correction, and us figuring out our weaknesses and tackling them head on. I think as Bruno said, that this is a bigger game globally and that the time doesn't allow for us just to retrench. And it certainly doesn't allow us just to go back to normal. The world has changed dramatically. And this country, my country, the United States, is really going through a struggle to figure out what its role in the world is going to be like. And I think we're going to be able to turn a chapter on sort of a negative side of thinking about it, whether it is President Trump's bullying of Germany to do more and spend more on defense, or even the phrase in the Obama administration of leading from behind. Those are not the recipes, I think, for success. 
And what we're grappling with here is what is a new model of U.S. engagement and leadership in the world that can be catalytic, that recognizes we can't do it all, we can't write the rules, it's not 1990, much less 1945, uh, that we need to be able to work with our allies and partners on big global challenges. And, and I think that really, as we grapple with that model of U.S. leadership, the challenge then is how do we shape this future of the world? How do we adapt the rules of this world and recognize that it's not the United States and the EU needing to head the EU needing to hedge between a rising China and a declining United States. That's got it wrong. The challenge we see is how are free people, free nations, and free societies shape a global order in which our people can be secure and prosperous in the face of rising authoritarians, more aggressive authoritarian regimes, namely China, but also Russia. And I think that's where we need to stay focused on the big goal, the big strategic goal. And while we are in a, a domestic focus right now, no doubt, there's a lot of strategic thinking taking place here. And I think the United States will not go back to the past, will not just further retrench, but is really struggling towards landing at a new model for international engagement in which we can work with our European partners of first resort, with other democracies like India, to really solve some problems and deal with the authoritarian challenge that we're going to face in the coming decades. Thank you so much, Damon, and we miss you also in Bratislava. But we're sure that next Globe Secure is going to be here physically with us. Uh, thank you also for bringing up Europe, uh, because that's exactly what I wanted to uh, talk about with Shada Islam, uh, who uh, has a lot of experience dealing with the European issues. And uh, Damon was talking about the United States having a lot of humility currently, thinking about fixing the, its own house before trying to, or in parallel to trying to rethink its global engagement model. And some people would say that Europe, to the contrary, has too much humility and uh, is too shy in engaging in the world. How do you see from where you sit right now? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I wish I was in Bratislava as well. Um, I have to say what Damon has said is music to my ears because I really think we need uh, U.S. engagement, but on a new pattern. Uh, a new standard, which is not leadership for leadership's sake or even leadership from behind, etc., but a U.S. that engages uh, as equal partners uh, with uh, other countries. And that's where I think what was said this morning by the foreign ministers at Bratislava is important. So you're right, uh, Alina, you say maybe we're too humble. Uh, maybe we take it too seriously and our differences sort of dominate our agenda rather than that what brings us together as Europeans. And uh, Louis Michel, the president of the EU Council, said, I think just a couple of days ago, we're big as Europeans, we're big, but we don't know it. So um, I think Europe is going to be uh, a leader with many on many issues, including climate change, Green Deal, which we are discussing at home. Uh, our differences are very public. Uh, yesterday, there was quite a tumultuous debate in the European Parliament about how fast to go or not. But we are leaders there. I think on digital, uh, ethical standards for digital that Bruno uh, spoke about, the need, you know, that digital is going to be so important, we set some standards. And I think what we're realizing now is though the U.S. is a very important partner, it is not our only anchor. We can stand and the world wants us to stand on our own two feet. We do not and we do not and we should not walk in America's shadow. And I think this is something that I hope um, whatever happens in the United States and if there is a change in the administration that the new administration will talk to Europe as an equal partner, and I hope that Europeans will get away from their uh, complexes and engage with Washington as an equal player. Um, no binary choices, and though it's very important to stand up to the authoritarians in the world, I think we also have to look at our own weaknesses. And I, I, I think what we need to work on uh, in Europe, uh, uh, Alina, this is very important, is our own internal challenges. Before we can be strong enough to stand up to the Chinas and the Russias of the world, 
even Turkey, we have to strengthen our own uh, standards. We have to be true to our core values. And we know uh, that across Europe today, in Centr Central and Eastern Europe, parts of uh, this, this region, there are real violations of the rule of law. This is becoming very public, and it is, I think, a, a tar, a really a blot on Europe's um, image and reputation, but also in our internal cohesion. So we have to sort that out. We also have to sort out uh, the inequalities that exist within Europe, uh, the economic in inequalities, but the social inequalities. And we've taken some steps through the new recovery package of actually having a fiscal stimulus rather than austerity packages, as we did in the past. So I think we have to work on that to make sure that there is a post-pandemic recovery that is good for everyone, including women, which have been in the who have been in the in the front line. And finally, I'd say we have to make sure that our neighborhood, our neighborhood, that we are strategic actors in our neighborhood. And we see uh, how problematic our relationship is at the moment with Russia, with Turkey, Belarus is a big problem, and now Nagorno-Karabakh as well. So let's set our standards high, let's walk tall, but also let's make sure that we deal with our very important internal challenges. Thank you so much, Shade. It's indeed a lot to sort out. I'm sure we'll pick up on a few of the issues that you mentioned. But first, I would like to go to Ambassador Dio, and, uh, who is joining us from Mumbai. And uh, it seems like an obvious question. While we're here discussing the relations between Europe, the US, or how we need to sort out our internal issues, the world is discussing that the 21st century is the Asian century. Uh, could you explain to us how would this Asian century look like, how the Asian countries already are are reshaping the global order and maybe potentially whether you still see the US as the global leader and whether you see this leadership potential in Europe as well. So uh, I want to begin by saying that uh, Asia is uh, uh, in a very troubled state uh, both because of coronavirus and China. Uh, in Asia, at least in India, we're not afraid of naming how expansive and aggressive China has become. And the two issues are actually inextricably linked. Asian economies are suffering hugely because we cannot afford the financial stimulus that the United States or the European countries have been able to offer. So just in India, the third quarter, GDP fell by almost 24% compared to the preceding year. The estimate is that by the end of the year, the economy will have shrunk 10%. There's also been a lot of mismanagement and a lot of suffering as a result, which is our own, which cannot be blamed on anybody else. But that is the reality for India, which is the third largest economy in Asia. The other problem is that China uh, had uh, earlier seemed uh, maybe advantages to Europe and the United States, which looked at it as a marketplace and profit for its multinationals. But in India, we feel the real weight uh, of China. It, today, just today, China is in a border war with India. It is pressurizing numerous countries in the South China Sea. For instance, Vietnam cannot even explore for energy in its own EEZ. It is terrorizing its, the populations on its periphery. So Inner Mongolia is not now supposed to stop holding any classes in the Mongolian language. The Xinjiang story is front page news everywhere. And it is everything that the countries and the creation of the United Nations was supposed to prevent from happening. In Tibet, the Chinese president has just said that they plan to sinicize Buddhism, just as they are sinicizing Islam in Xinjiang. I think it requires more reaction from other countries. And unfortunately, that's not all. Uh, China has managed to split ASEAN, even as it has created wedges in the European Union itself with its 17 plus one uh, uh, forum. Uh, the Gulf dynamics are a whole new thing in Asia with the movements that are taking place towards the recognition of Israel, 
countries uh, building up relationships. Now, I'm not arguing that we shouldn't have these changes, but these changes are a lot to absorb because what happens doesn't stay in the Gulf. The religious uh, uh, consequences of that flow out into numerous other Asian countries. You have a peace process going on in Afghanistan, which does not look much like a peace process with the continuing violence and the killings that are going on. Now, I'm not even naming all the little wars uh, that are underway, or the actions of Turkey in Syria or, uh, or elsewhere. But we also have other issues in Asia which we're trying to grapple with. Uh, trade is free. Certainly in India, it has been uh, five years since India felt that it wanted even to have a free trade agreement with anybody. But deglobalization has begun. Countries are moving out, companies are moving out of China very slowly and in very small numbers, but to some other Southeast Asian countries and occasionally to India. Japan has set up a fund to encourage its companies to leave. China has all kinds of problems with Australians. Two journalists had to flee more or less at night so that they wouldn't become victims of sudden arrests. Then there is the whole question of the disruption to supply lines and technology. I think technology is a very important factor globally, but also in Asia. It's been a, a real positive for better distribution of welfare benef benefits, at least in India, which has the largest network, Aadhaar, which extends to 800 million people. It has not been absorbed very much in manufacturing or agricultural practices in India or other South Asian countries. But it's also been very bad in terms of the misuse of social media for the kind of uh, you know, violence that it has generated in, uh, in India. I think that uh, we, we have to also look at the possibilities. So India has become a much more active member of the Quad with the United States, with Japan and Australia. European countries uh, would be welcome to come into this in some format as France is already uh, raising the profile of its activities in Asia. I think we cannot uh, wait much longer. The speed with which uh, China has become so aggressive and its wolf warrior diplomacy, which was so state driven, we haven't heard anything about it for the last two months. But before that, they were using diplomats in Sweden, in Australia, globally, wherever you looked. There has been interference in the internal political affairs, and Australia is a very prominent case for that. I think we, these, these issues deserve recognition. Uh, they deserve a, a speedier understanding and analysis, um, and they also need, as I think uh, was pointed out uh, by Mikhaes, that A, there is going to be industries which will become more locally uh, built up, pharma, food, whatever it is. I think there also has to be a recognition that uh, policies, the European policies towards China cannot be conditioned only by the need to sell cars or luxury goods or wines or whatever. If in fact Europe believes in its own values, then it has to take a stronger stand. And certainly the United States has, but only very recently, become much more active on these issues. So I'm not sure we're going to get an Asian century. In fact, China no longer speaks about an Asian century. It speaks about a Chinese dream which has to be achieved. Uh, the, the difficulties within the European countries are enormous at this moment. And, uh, and I think that uh, we are looking for uh, support and assistance in trying to keep free and open uh, maritime uh, uh, movements, uh, free and open access in technology, and the role of tech companies, I think, has been highlighted 
most recently by the United States. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And uh, uh, there are a few issues that you mentioned that we'll definitely come back to. Uh, when you started saying that Asia is uh, in a very troubled state, I realized that probably the whole world is in a very troubled state, uh, or at least I can barely recollect a part that is not troubled right now, which doesn't bode well on the future, but hope will speed up some of the solutions. I'm going to go back to Bruno and the two issues that you mentioned concerning tech and climate, but also connected to the theme that's been recurring current throughout the interventions of several speakers, and that's the values. When you were talking that we need to act fast uh, uh, and like rethink uh, socially and politically how we deal with climate and tech, there's always this discussion that uh, China, that was already mentioned several times before, first is moving much faster in this direction, but also in terms of the values that China is connecting to the, especially the issue of technology, is moving in a very different direction. Uh, can you outline for us uh, how you see this uh, next between tech and values and feel free to pick up on climate as well but also whether there is uh, a chance for the global engagement uh, in a cooperative manner on these rather divisive currently issues well that's a, that's the, the real really the central question um, I think there's a, a, a bit of, of misunderstanding when we uh, comment on the different reactions in different countries and the relative success in dealing with COVID because in fact the approach was fundamentally different China took the COVID pandemic as a national security crisis, and Europe and the US did not. Now, there are many documents published by think tanks and government agencies in the past, Damon will know well about this, that sometimes described a pandemic as a national security crisis, but that was never really meant very seriously. Uh, and it wasn't taken seriously in the United States or in Europe. Uh, the pandemic there was taken as a health crisis a public health crisis, and it was dealt with in that way. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a debate to be had whether the reaction should have been different, and in fact, whether we should have taken it as a, as a national security crisis. But we didn't, and for reasons that are not so difficult to understand, because we thought that that would interfere with individual freedom, individual rights, in a way that was not called for. But China clearly took it as a national security crisis, took it as a crisis that could affect the survival of the regime, the survival of the state, and certainly its standing. Even if the survival was not at stake, its standing and its plans for the next few decades, which, by the way, had been articulated before COVID, even had a timetable. By 2049, China was supposed to reach the same level of global power as the United States, and then in the second half of the century, was supposed to overcome it. Now, this was the pandemic was received in Beijing as a direct threat to these plans, as a direct threat to the state. And that informed the reaction in Beijing, which is certainly the goal was to deal with the crisis as quickly and definitively as possible, no matter what the social cost was uh, and no matter what the consequences for individuals were. Uh, it's also uh, easy to understand why there was a clash between um, the way China dealt with the crisis and the way Europeans and Americans dealt with it, which, by the way, created a backlash for China. Because clearly in, in, uh, in the West, uh, we had, we, you know, there was different ways in which we talked about a, a potential pandemic. But for the most part, if you read those documents, the pandemic was always presented as a case of international cooperation. I remember so many discussions where, you know, over, over the past decade, where we always presented a pandemic as the sort of the, the, the school case example of uh, a, a situation where we could work with China, we could work with Russia, we could work with Iran, we could work with everyone. So if we go back to what happened in March and April, um, and let, let us focus on Europe, while Europeans were seeing the pandemic as, again, a case of global cooperation, China was seeing it as a case of acute global competition. And I think that is actually the cause of this backlash that we've seen. Um, uh, yesterday, we saw the latest results from Pew about uh, uh, how uh, public opinion in Europe sees China, and they were devastating for Beijing. In every country, with the exception of Italy, uh, the past few months have seen a uh, steep rise in negative views of China. And that was the reason. The reason was that Europeans did not take well to the fact that uh, at a moment when humanity should come together the way we saw it, uh, China was actually actively taking that as a moment for acute competition. Remember those tweets by Chinese ambassadors pointing out where Italy had failed, where France had failed, 
uh, it was extraordinary, you know, in my opinion, extraordinarily clumsy. But it's not so much a question of being clumsy. It's that the framework, the intellectual framework that had been prepared in advance was, this is a national security crisis. That's how we're going to deal with it. Now, I, I'll, I'll conclude by saying that, of, of course, this shows uh, there's entirely different approaches. Uh, China is preparing for the return of great power politics, already considers that we live in that world, um, expects a reaction from the United States, and is actively uh, thinking about moments of acute competition. Um, and that we, we have to be prepared for that, and I think we have to adapt uh, our own strategy to that. Uh, now, the question, as you, you raised about climate, I suspect it's going to be the same thing. Um, uh, it's going to be taken by many actors all over the world as a moment when the great game is being played very intensely. The same thing that we saw with COVID could very easily happen with climate change. If a country is suffering particularly from the impact of climate change, other powers, we're going to see it as a, an opportunity to increase their relative power. If, if, if uh, climate events in one country make it impossible to continue with the normal economic activity and industrial production, many countries are going to see it as an opportunity to actually relocalize industry to their own, uh, to, to their own economies. Uh, so I think we have to be prepared for that. And then the question, we'll, we'll come back to it, I'm sure, Damon and, and Sheila and, and the ambassador will have opinions on this, is do we, do we play the same game that China is playing? Because we, we're convinced that we're going to lose if we don't adapt our strategies. Uh, do we keep playing the, the old game? And then I think, I think we would lose. Or do we try to find some middle point where we adapt some elements of our strategies to the new age while preserving still a different approach uh, and uh, different values when when it comes to, to dealing with world politics. Thank you, for <clears throat> thank you for asking the question that I was thinking about as well. So I'll go with it straight to Damon. Uh, and just to elaborate what uh, Bruno was saying, because you described the opinion in Europe, but as far as I remember also the Pew polls about the United States is that the opinion about China is not that different between the Democrats and Republicans. There are some differences, but in a way it's converging. So Damon, would you also say that the United States is in this combative mindset and the mindset of the power play and how exactly are we playing this game? Lane, I think that's a, a critical point. Uh, yes, the United States is really politically divided right now. You see partisanship as we go into the final stretch of an election. And yet during a very divisive political period in the United States, Democrats and Republicans have really coalesced around a, a new grand strategy that does uh, has almost thoroughly replaced the, the old war on terror with this uh, paradigm of great power competition. And so what we haven't settled on is the, the policies and the tactics that will inform that. But there is a growing recognition that this challenge is from a rising China. The challenge is from state-led, often corrupt, authoritarian regimes, a rising China, a revanchist Russia. And that actually provides a basis of agreement, uh, despite our political differences, across the political spectrum in the United States, a strong congressional view of this in both caucuses. That's going to continue. What we got to get right is that the, if that's what your view is at a strategic level, the natural consequence is that you better bring together your partners, your allies, and build as many coalitions as possible so that like-minded nations can stand up and deal with this great challenge. And that's where we've fallen flat in the past couple of years. So right now, we're in the middle of a body blow for the world, for the United States in particular, with this pandemic, the economic catastrophe that's come with it. And I think it provides us an opportunity to wake up. I think our election is going to be a little bit of this kind of jolt. And to understand that we can't just pick back up. We've got to formulate a post-COVID recovery strategy that's built pragmatically, but one of confidence. We need to understand that it's a time to forge a new kind of relationship, not just with Europe, but with democratic countries, like-minded partners globally, so that we can go on offense and, and helping to ensure that we come out of this, this crippling pandemic with a more coordinated fiscal and monetary stimulus for our economies, with a recognition that, yes, we will need to protect sensitive supply chains, but it might not, the answer might not be just national reshoring. It might be reshoring in a way of reliable democratic supply chains so that we can count on our friends for some of this, and to align ourselves where we have to compete more effectively with China, 
but also to figure out where it's in our interest to find a way to cooperate as it will be on climate. But we need a little bit more strategic clarity and we need to understand that the challenge we face from China requires the United States to do this with as many friends, partners and allies as possible, bringing together our European allies and friends and, and joining forces with our Asian allies, with India, with others, so that we can help shape, uh, shape this future. And I think that's a, a little bit of where we need to go in the coming two years. Thank you so much, Damon. Uh, and uh, I will go with the same question to also to Shada to look at the European dimension of that. Bruno explained that in a way there's an awakening about uh, China in Europe. And what Damon is talking about is basically that uh, gradually Europe is trying to, the pendulum is swinging in the direction where the United States uh, are going in terms of the European perception of China. But you also were talking that we're a bit slow in Europe trying to fix internal problems. Do you see this uh, change of the mindset in Europe when it comes to China being also already converted into some specific policies that are also more or less in line with the policy of the United States? Thank you very much. So let me let me start with what uh, I, I think you said was about whether we can find the middle point between extremist positions and whether we can, uh, I, I think, actually negate this whole concept of great power competition. Um, it's not in Europe's interest to have a great power competition because Europe is a, is a middle power a good power, a strong power, but it is not a great power. And that is to our advantage. So I think Europe uh, has been taking a different approach, uh, not just regarding uh, China, but also regarding geopolitics in general. Um, I think we have, as Europeans, uh, underlined repeatedly and actually acted on it as well, is the cooperative approach. Now you can scoff at it and say, oh my God, cooperation doesn't lead to anything. But I ask you, has uh, great power competition led to anything. Do we not have to deal with uh, climate change, pandemics, poverty, Agenda 2030, sustainable development goals? And is great power competition, is this um, confrontation between US and China going to lead to any solutions to some of the biggest problems facing humanity today? And I'm talking about people. I'm, I'm talking about people, women, children, minorities, the way the world has to be. So can we actually afford uh, to, to go down that route? Because I don't think we can. And I think we need to rethink. And interestingly, um, and, and Bruno has talked about it, uh, the pandemic has shown, I mean, sure, we said, you know, the pandemic has no borders, viruses have no borders. But what was our first reflection, even within Europe, was to try and bring down the borders. So Schengen, our border-free, uh, frontier-free zone, almost collapsed. So I think we, we really have to rethink the world as, as, it, as we want it to be and then work towards it. Now, to come back to your real question about China and whether we're um, uh, getting a different policies. Now, I get a little uh, fed up when, uh, not you, Alina, but when uh, certain American friends and others talk about how Europe is naive in its dealings with China. I mean, I take that with a pinch of salt because really there is no knife to, uh, in there. We are realistic about China. We know that we need to compete on certain issues. Human rights uh, are a big uh, source of uh, differences and discord. Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, Taiwan, uh, the South China Sea, all of these are are articulated by our leaders um, uh, uh, and very, very often, I mean, practically, I would say, every week, whether it's an EU summit or a foreign minister's meeting or meetings with the Chinese. So there's no secret about how different uh, we are. But we also realize, as I said, that great power competition is not going to get us anything uh, tangible in terms of the development we need. So we need to cooperate. And we need to cooperate on many, many issues. And um, as Damon said as well, I think that's going to be, if Joe Biden is in the White House, that's going to be the White House policy as well. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is, so, uh, you know, if we are serious, China itself also is changing its view of the world. And um, if you do public opinion polls in China, how they view Europe, because we have a very West-centric attitude, you know, we are looking at how we feel about China or India or America. 
uh, how do the Chinese feel? I think the Chinese are also bewildered by, by Europe at the moment and losing confidence and perhaps losing trust in what they thought was, uh, was a good friend. So let's think about that. The other thing to think about is if decoupling, as uh, America is, uh, is, is thinking of or Trump is thinking of, um, China's thinking of that as well. So what happens in this world? We have decoupling of China, you know, the, the concept now of dual uh, circulation, internal circulation, growth in internal demand, less export oriented and less import oriented. So less outward looking. That's going to have an immense impact on the global economy and is going to have an immense impact on our plans for a sustained and green recovery. So let's be careful what we wish for. And, and so I think, you know, if we are going to be talking about where we can work together, and I'd like to bring in Africa into this, into this conversation, because one area where we can uh, work with China, uh, actually with Turkey, India, uh, South Korea, Japan as well, is Africa, because Africa requires and wants uh, countries, Europeans and others to work together because of the development needs and the impact of COVID-19. As we know, it has not been that bad on the health systems, but has been devastating for Africa's economy. So my plea to the world and to everyone who's talking about let's have this great power competition and a new Cold War is think about what it means for people, for you and me and our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sada. And I'll go straight to Ambassador Dia also for your take on the great power competition, but also specifically, if you could, you mentioned a little bit some of the areas where, where we can cooperate, including, for example, you called for Europe to be more involved in quad cooperation in Asia uh, or on the issue of technology. Could you expand a little bit more where you see the greatest potential? And also, if you could pick up on the points that Shada was making about engaging in Africa, how we can work work with various Asian countries there, but also in other parts of the world? So uh, I would like to say that in Asia, with a long, undemarcated border with China, we really feel the weight of China. But I think we should also have on the table the fact that it is not only with India that China has uh, border issues. It is claiming territory from Bhutan, Bhutan is less than a million people altogether. It has taken over parts of Nepal. Uh, I mean, China has a territorial uh, appetite which uh, should concern everybody. It claims the whole of the South China Sea. And the historical basis of many of these claims really needs to be challenged. I mean, so Admiral He made a voyage in the 16th century. I mean, you know, uh, on the basis of Columbus's voyages, Lisbon can, uh, Portugal can claim the whole world or something. Uh, I think some, a lot of this has to be called out. Uh, I think, uh, I, I mean, I, I would just like to say that the lesson of COVID was that China is not looking for cooperation. It is actually, as Mikhail pointed out, it saw that as a matter of survival of the party the reputation of the president, it did not see it as an issue for cooperation. On climate, China has actually done quite well in some areas, but only in those areas where it sees profitability for its own corporations, not areas, so uh, electric vehicles or batteries or something. But it is continuing to build uh, fossil fuel power plants all over the world under its Belt and Road uh, uh, initiative. I, I also really believe that, um, you know, if, if we are looking for cooperation from China, I think we might get some cooperation by coming together, not by India looking for cooperation uh, by itself or even Europe looking to cooperate with China. Yes, up to a point you might get some cooperation. I don't think the, I think the Chinese plans uh, are not secret. They've all been laid out for what it wants to achieve by the 75th year, by the 100th year of the creation of the Chinese Communist Party. If you look at any of the documents that are being put out, China is not at this moment seeking cooperation. It is 
has declared that everybody led by the United States is trying to contain its growth and its welfare. Uh, so yes, uh, I think the question is not of naive, naivet. I think the question is where uh, any Euro the Europeans or India or the United States, uh, how we define uh, our uh, future uh, understandings and how we define our future aspiration. Uh, it has to go beyond economics, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And sorry, if I may just add one sentence. Uh, I don't think China is looking for cooperation in Africa. China has, has built itself up so big uh, in Africa. So many of those countries are already in a debt trap. China did not respond positively to the pleas of the UN Secretary General for uh, you know a moratorium on debt even in the period of the pandemic. It joined later on, but that doesn't mean there is any debt forgiveness. It's going to demand all those payments. And certainly in Asia, we know that it has taken over, for instance, a whole port and surrounding area in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And I think it's a good moment to um, check whether there are questions in the audience. Please raise your hands. There are all right, so think about it. Any moment you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll make sure you have an opportunity to ask it. Uh, and if not, I'll continue with my questions. And I, I still want to talk a little bit more about this, what for me seems to be an, for now, incomprehensible dilemma on how to move forward. Bruno, you were saying that yourself, that China is into this mentality that everything is an issue of strategic competition, including the pure case, uh, book case, uh, uh, example of pandemic. Uh, and then, for example, uh, we're saying that we do not want the great power competition. How do we actually start cooperate with somebody who is not seeking cooperation, but at the same time, we are seeking this cooperation? What kind of a pinpoint diplomacy we can invent in the current environment to de-escalate at least this emotional perception of uh, not, co not willing to cooperate? Right. So I, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about the possibilities of cooperation and multilateralism, at least in the sense that we talked about those concepts since 1945. Uh, not saying that they are gone forever, but I think we're going to go through a period, let us call it a tunnel, where those concepts are going to be very difficult to apply. I look at the United Nations today, and sometimes it looks more like a think tank, a very well-funded think tank, than, uh, than what it was supposed to be. It's been completely absent from the Syrian crisis. It's been completely absent from the, uh, the corona crisis, at least in all elements that are not directly related to the, to the World Health Organization. Uh, so what do we do? I think it's still possible to strike a balance. Uh, it's still possible to strike a balance with China that is rooted in the old concept of balance of power. Uh, do we need to continue trying to change China into a Western-style democracy? You know, as I argue in, in my latest book, that experiment didn't go so well in Iraq, where it was supposedly easy. Uh, do we really believe that China is going to collapse like the Soviet Union if we apply a little bit of pressure uh, and that the Communist Party is going to dissolve? Uh, having lived in China very recently for a year, I find that difficult to believe. Uh, I see the Communist Party with uh, high levels of legitimacy. People. Uh, seem to accept the rule. That could change, but, but that's what you, talking to people in, in, in private, confidential environments uh, and trying to understand the country, uh, that's the impression I got, I, I, I got away with. Um, so we do need to be concerned about Chinese expansionism. We need to be concerned with a China that has first uh, risen too fast with destabilizing effects in many geographies, and second, has, uh, I believe, taken a disproportionate share of globalization's advantages. If you look at globalization over the past 35 years, uh, there's books that actually try to calculate this, and, and China gets uh, something between two-thirds and, and, and nine-tenths of the advantages from the creation of global value chains. That doesn't seem fair on the face of it, and a country like India, I think, is not going to accept that any longer, uh, even if it involves some kind of economic conflict with China. 
So we, we, we have somehow to redress this without the old evangelical approach uh, of trying to change China. Talking quickly about Europe, um, it's very frustrating when you talk in Beijing with officials, intellectuals, academics, they don't take Europe seriously. Now, you could argue the United States doesn't take Europe seriously. It sends the FCC chairman over European capitals to tell us what companies in China we can have business with or not. I think that's humiliating for Europeans, uh, and it explains what happened in the last two years where Europeans are talking more seriously about strategic autonomy. But China is the same. Uh, every, every important Chinese figure you talk to in Beijing, they think Europe doesn't exist, that Europe does what the United States tells us to do. And they don't understand how false this is, because what happened over the past two years was not that Europe was pushed into a slightly more confrontational approach with China by Washington. It was a movement coming from within European society. And if you want one example, it came very strongly from German industry. The German industry thought that Chinese companies would stay in the lower segments of the value chain and w would work for the greater prosperity of the German economy. And uh, sometime three or four years ago, they realized that this was not the case and that they were actually in danger of being replaced by Chinese-led value chains. That and many other movements coming deep from within European society explains why we now talk about China as a systemic rival and a competitor. Uh, China doesn't seem to understand this. I, you know, when I talk to my Chinese friends, I try to make the point, either you understand this and you reach some kind of agreement with Europe that's going to rebalance the economic relationship. You cannot get nine-tenths of the benefits. Let's rebalance so that we get half. Or if you don't understand this, and it has to be fast, then you're going to lose Europe. Because we, we're not going to stand for this. We're not going to stand for this kind of economic relationship with China, where China gets all the benefits. Uh, and I want to go to Shada Islam, because I feel, Shada, like you're going to disagree with Bruno. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and specifically, I would like to, you to pick up on two issues. Uh, one issue was the multilateral institutions that uh, uh, nobody is taking too seriously right now, but Europe does seem to still believe in them and probably is the last man standing who is trying to invest in them, try to reform them, or to make sure that there is some platform for cooperation globally. And the second point, what Bruno was talking about, is this, what he called the evangelical approach to transforming the world. Uh, and I understand what you're saying, that we're not going to transform China, or for that sake, maybe not any other country. But uh, what I also feel is that for Europe, this is a very revolutionary s thought because we used to think that we're the normative power and uh, we can transform at least the countries in our neighborhood. And actually other countries in a way demand that from Europe, that Europe needs to stand up to human rights. Uh, if you listen to the people from Hong Kong and from Belarus for that matter, they do expect that from Europe. So Shada, how do you respond to Bruno? Okay, so uh, yes, I, I, I do take uh, some kind of, a, let's say, challenging approach towards what uh, Bruno's been saying. So on multilateralism, look, we don't have an option because Europe itself is multilateral. So if we abandon the idea of multilateralism on a global scale, we're also uh, abandoning it within our own European Union. And, you know, we are. Um, we're brilliant at compromises. Sometimes the compromises are, you know, considered to be sub, uh, suboptimal, but we know how to work with differences. Uh, we have Hungary and Poland in Europe at the moment, you know, and not just that, but we also have very, very differences, great differences among uh, on our values with many countries. So we are a multilateral group. Um, and I think in Europe, we understand that the current system has changed. And, you know, everyone's talking about the rise of China and how that has absolutely uh, transformed the world. Uh, do you from, uh, or the Eurocentric or the Western centric world? Um, remember, I mean, I was uh, writing for the Far Eastern Economic Review in those days, based in Hong Kong. I was uh, their Europe correspondent. When Japan emerged as an uh, economic superpower, I still have those articles that I was writing about the Western response. You know, a lot of what we're saying about China, uh, 
you know, not to do with the communist system, but with the rise of China and its challenge to the Western centric economic model, but also to the West in terms of, you know, an Asian power rising um, has echoes of what happened with Japan. And, you know, I, I think we need to realize. And, and so it's, it's rather interesting when um, I, I hear Bruno say, China has risen too fast. Uh, yes, of course, it's risen very fast. Uh, but too fast for whom? Uh, too fast for us in the West to sort of cope with the challenges that brings on the global level and in our relationships uh, worldwide, or too fast for its own people? Um, I wouldn't say so. I would say that, you know, if you uh, have uh, uh, people climbing out of poverty in 30 years, 35 years, I would say it hasn't risen too fast. And my fear now is that with all this talk, this uh, China is accepting that its economic growth will slow down. I mean, that's going to be the big issue now, but it's accepting it. And as I said, this uh, idea of a dual circulation that's changing also the economic thinking. Meanwhile, um, nothing is static. We in Europe are beginning to think about subsidizing and creating ind industrial champions. We will have our own semi-state-owned enterprises. Uh, we are talking about screening investments. We're talking about national champions, strategic autonomy. So uh, the pandemic uh, has changed uh, the way we are thinking here in Europe, but also in, in China. So I think we need to be a bit careful about that. Now, I'll say, you know, also when we talk about great power competition and we're talking about states, um, what we're forgetting, and I'm surprised that we are, because we're talking to each other uh, on technology, we are connected despite the fact that we're all over the globe. And that power of technology is bringing people together. It's creating a lot of dissonance as well. It's creating, you know, uh, fake news and disinformation. But in many ways, people who think alike, whether it's on climate change or fighting poverty or equality, racial justice, social justice, people are beginning to work together. And for me, the strength of today's world doesn't come from states and, you know, President Trump or Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin. It comes from people, uh, whether they're out in the streets demanding democracy or whether they're working together to defeat climate change and work for poverty. It's civil society, young women, young men, and I have to say at the sub-national level, what impresses me in today's world, and that's multilateralism as well, but not the way we know it, is the power of mayors and cities. So when we talk about all these, you know, big concepts, let's not forget in the real world, power now is diffused. And there, coming back to your question, Alina, about Europe, um, let's not talk about soft power in this sort of derogatory way that we always have. Soft power is also power of the mind. And if we indulge in a kind of group thing where everything has to be always the best for the West and, and not for the rest, then I think we're not playing our role as human beings and part of this wider community. So uh, sorry I've been a bit long, but the world is changing. Uh, bits of it are going to go in the direction that Bruno's talking about, which is, I think, the capitals and, you know, the states. But the bits that are not state, the non-state side of things, is working, moving ahead. And we need to provide them with the funding, the resources and the support to go further ahead. So China has risen, uh, and I wish other countries in, in, the, in the emerging world would rise uh, as fast as China so that there's less, less hunger and less poverty and more progress and more education for everyone. Thank you so much for highlighting the potential of the sub-national units, be it individual or the mayors. Uh, and I'm going to sneak in here the question from the audience. I would just ask you to go to the microphone so that we can also have you on the screen with us. And if there is any other question, please raise your hand because that would be uh, the last opportunity to do so. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Adam Neumann. I work for the Institute for Security Policy in Kiel. And I want to ask a more general question about multilateralism. We understood that in the recent conflicts around Europe, there was no UN to be seen or could be in any way helpful. And uh, also, if we look at now the Eastern Mediterranean, the crisis we have, the EU has a problem because it's itself, so it, its members are part of the, the warring states, if I want to say. Do the panelists see possibly in the future for the OSCE uh, a larger role, that, which of course doesn't go for around the world, but at least in Europe, 
to take up sort of that responsibility of multilateralism that uh, the other um, organizations are currently failing us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll probably very quickly, because that was specifically a concern in Europe, I'll give 60 seconds to uh, Bruno and Shada and then uh, change a bit the question for other speakers. Go ahead. I'll just respond to Chada in 30 seconds and leave this question for, for Damon and the ambassador. But uh, Chada asked, uh, what do I mean when I say China's risen too quickly? Two examples. Uh, after China's accession to the World Trade Organization, uh, the Portuguese textile and footwear industry was wiped out in five years. And then by 2011, we entered a deep financial crisis with 16% unemployment. Uh, they were still trying to come out of it. Now, Shada, this could have been better managed. Instead of having a turbocharged, market-led, China-led process of disruption, we could have managed this better, more smoothly and more slowly. Second example, Sihanoukville in Cambodia that I visited just before COVID, used to have 75,000 people, Khmer people, speaking Khmer with Khmer signage on, on the shops. Now it has close to 200,000 people, out of which 150,000 are Chinese. You can't see a single shop signage in Khmer anymore. And if you're Khmer, it's your, it's your city and can't live anymore. You, you, you can't uh, speak your language. Uh, the rents have gone so far up that you had to move to some other city, and many have gone to Phnom Penh. Again, this could have been better managed, no? Uh, no one is saying that China cannot rise, but rise in a way that looks more like a tsunami taking everything in its wake, uh, I think many people around the world are not happy about that. Uh, thank you for that. So I'll take the OOC question actually to Shada because we need to answer that one. Do you see the potential for it to play in a bigger role and in a way replacing UN in some aspects? Look, I think any, every little bit helps. Um, I think the OSC definitely could play a role. The United Nations, you're absolutely right, is missing in that region. Um, there's NATO as well, NATO with its less military side. So every little bit would help. I don't want to get into a bilateral uh, debate with Bruno, but I want to say My just two things that you'll allow me. <laughs> yes, we are. Um, two things. One, uh, Portugal was told and was protected by the multi-fiber agreement against exports of textiles from developing countries for four decades. Uh, so that was enough ample time to uh, uh, reposture uh, your textile industry. But I do see your point. And secondly, you know, Bruno, when you talk about when you don't recognize your city anymore or your country anymore, sounds to me a little bit like Europeans saying, oh, my God, there's so many immigrants here. I can't recognize my London anymore. There. Just like, okay. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go to Damon. Damon, probably the United States is one country that is often berated for destroying the international institutions. Which ones do you think actually are worth saving or reforming? Or do you see the new emerging multilateral organizations that are going to take the place of the old ones? So, Lena, I think, I think this is a critical point because the, the point is not multilateral organizations. The point is effective solutions. And so if you think back, what did we do coming out of the catastrophe of World War II? We had a dual track where we created universal institutions, the UN system, the Bretton Woods Institution was open to the Soviets, even the Marshall Plan. But as we realized the commensurate scale of the challenge coming from communism, we supplemented this universal approach with something that gave coordination among democracies around the free world, the NATO alliance, other alliances, and other economic coordination institutions. So flash forward to today, what should we be doing? We don't just take our marbles and go home out of the UN. We gotta compete effectively in, in international institutions and try to help shape them and make them more effective and help make them uh, be places that can represent our interests and our values. But what we need to do is have healthy competition by fostering another parallel set of democratic coordination mechanisms that really are a place for democracies, free nations to actually come together to have more effective solutions. So for example, in Europe, the OSCE can have a role It is a universal institution that brings everybody to the table. That's useful, but we have to recognize its shortcomings. So we better sure as have a sharp coordination mechanisms among democracies to help push and cajole to certain solutions. And it's that, that dexterity where we can play on both formulas that's how we can produce more effective solutions, not to be lost just with the concept of multilateralism in and of itself. 
Thank you, Damon. And uh, I'll go as a last remarks to Ambassador Dio, because what Damon, uh, at least if I'm interpreting it correctly, you're talking about the same thing, that there should be more coordination and cooperation between the democracies, of course, on top of what exists today. What would be your uh, concluding advice to all of us uh, in terms of how do we actually move forward on this coordination? So I think uh, being clear-eyed helps. I think uh, being willing to say, take the names and say things which uh, are not pleasant to say but need to be said. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, Shada mentioned that we are all uh, interconnected globally, etc., etc. All true, except that on social media, Chinese people are not globally connected. China has created a closed system. So while we may be trying to understand China, I don't think Chinese people are trying to understand people in the rest of the world. Uh, that's the same, uh, and it's the same attitude. It's a gaming of the system. Uh, you know, the problems with WTO or with, you know, uh, allowing uh, uh, developing countries to have their textile sectors protected. But there are reasons why those did not grow. And China has been gaming them. And just one final example, among a host of reasons, uh, the United uh, Nations was not able to do anything or even say anything on the pandemic was because uh, China did not allow the UN Security Council, of which it is a veto-wielding member, to take a position. And it was the chair of the General Assembly in, in the months that this pandemic spread everywhere. So uh, the issue was not taken up. This is gaming the system, and I think we have to recognize that for all those who actually would like the system to work better, uh, I think we, ha we have to stop uh, uh, thinking that it's just going to s resume its functioning. There has to be reform, and there has to be pressure on China to allow it to be reformed so that it works for the benefit of everybody. Thank you so much, Ambassador. I am being very clear, I, and I see right in front of me the sign that our time is up. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for the uh, very productive discussion. Uh, we had some disagreements, uh, as that's natural in the today's world, but we also had some agreements on the way forward. So thank you very much, everybody. In 10 minutes in this room, we're going to have uh, at least uh, equally fascinating session on the future of democracy uh, with the speakers that include also Commissioner Vera Yurova, uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright, uh, and others. So please stay here, and I'm sure we'll continue the conversation. Thank you very much, our day speakers, for joining us online as well.